apologize for all the technical difficulties. Um, they worked really hard. And Jacques and I want to thank all of the Zeitgeist members who really worked so hard to make this possible. We appreciate it so much. And whoops, what happened here? <laughs> Lost my mic. Okay. Um, and also the audiovisual people <laughs> who, who volunteered and eventually it worked. So um, I also want to mention that for those who don't know this, Jacques, all those designs in this video were done by Jacques Fresco. So, yeah. So unlike the film you just saw, we live in a world where our social systems are old. Our language is old. The way we acquire goods and services is outdated. And our cities are detrimental to our health, chaotic, and a tremendous waste of energy and resources. And our politicians do not provide a way out of these problems. In other words, they don't serve us. Is this on? OK. Can you hear me back there? Yeah, OK, great, thanks. But our technology is racing forward. We're trying to adjust to the rapid advances in technology with obsolete values that no longer work in our technological age. What is needed is a change in our sense of direction and purpose, an alternative vision of a sustainable new world civilization unlike anything in the past. This is what we are presenting here, and we call it the Venus Project. And it's an activist arm organized by Peter Joseph, which I guess you've just gotten a briefing of, is called the Zeitgeist Movement. When I refer to sustainability, I'm not referring to sustainability for the banks that keep us in perpetual debt or the corporations or our obsolete social systems that we all live under. By sustainability, we mean the well-being of all people in a new system that would help bring them to their highest potential while protecting and preserving the environment. What I'm talking about is the intelligent management of the Earth's resources by using the methods of science to organize and manage society. I'm not referring to scientists running things, but the methods of science applied to the way we live to achieve a more humane society for everyone. We apply the scientific method in limited areas, in such things as surgery, the building of aircraft, skyscrapers, bridges, and automobiles. Over the centuries, we've developed a consensus that when it comes to matters of personal safety, we choose science and technology rather than primitive belief systems or politics because science has been proven to work then why don't we use scales of scientific performance when it comes to planning our societies, transportation systems, agriculture, health care, and so on, as a total integrated systems approach? If science has a lot to do with what works, then clearly there's much about today's social and economic system that is not working because things don't work very well for the majority of the world's people or the environment. If they were, war, poverty, hunger, homelessness, pollution would have been solved long ago. Unfortunately, our social systems evolved with no overall global planning or an understanding of what shapes our behavior, and these things aren't being considered today. The Venus Project, on the other hand, 
wants to apply an intelligent method of planning for planetary survival. If we don't use scientific methods to the way we live, unnecessary human suffering will continue. We have the technological ability and the resources to feed, house, educate, and clothe everyone on the planet. But our practice of rationing resources through the use of money never, pro never provided the means to do so. Then how do we even begin to solve our problems by using the methods of the monetary system that we all live under? The use of money is hardly ever examined, but let's consider it along with how much it influences our behavior and our values. Money doesn't have any value at all. There's no gold or anything to back it up. It's just a picture on a cheap piece of paper with an agreement amongst people as to what it can buy. And I would say a forced agreement because we really don't regulate the prices of things. If it rained $100 bills right now, everyone would be happy except the bankers. So let's look at money. Money is just an interference factor between what you need and what you're able to get. People think in terms of wanting a job to get the money to buy the things that they need. But if they really thought about it, it's not the job or the money that people need, but access to the necessities of life. The use of money results in social stratification and elitism. They say in America that, people are e are, that all people are equal, but most people don't buy the kind of car they want or the house they want. They buy what they can afford. Many cultures tell their people that they are free. But really, you're only as free as your purchasing power. How can someone have freedom when they can't get the best medical care or education for their children? Most people are slaves to jobs that they don't really like only because they need the money. Many laws are enacted for the benefit of corporations who have the money to lobby, bribe, and persuade government officials to make laws to serve their own interests. People say that the monetary system pro produces incentive. This may be true to a limited extent, but it also produces greed, corruption, poverty, and tremendous unnecessary human suffering. We have to look at the entire picture. The monetary system is based on artificial scarcity. For example, food products are often destroyed just to keep the prices up. There's a tremendous waste of resources as a result of frequent superficial design changes. This is quite evident in the fashion industry. Our social system is based on the need to continuously buy. You and I in this system are merely consumers. There's a tremendous environmental degradation due to the higher cost of more appropriate waste disposal. In other words, the earth is being plundered for profit. The recent oil spill in the Gulf is a good example of this. But one of the greatest waste of resources and lives is the military. How shameful that it's one of the most profitable and biggest industries in the world. It's little understood just how much our values are shaped by the monetary system. Our values are influenced by the media for the benefit of the establishment. And by this, I mean the banks, the military, 
and the corporations. For the most part, they determine the public agenda to serve their own interests. They perpetuate the illusion that society's values are determined by the ground up. They do this with empty words such as freedom, patriotism, and democracy. What we have all over the world is managed news by and for the establishment. They produce the books, the newspapers, the TV shows, the movies, education, and entertainment, which in turn shapes our values and our behavior. And they do this to keep things as they are. Most important, when the corporation's bottom line is profit, all decisions are made not for the benefit of people or the environment, but primarily for the acquisition of wealth, property, and power. For instance, if your country really cared about you, they wouldn't outsource jobs for cheaper wages elsewhere. What if all the money in the world suddenly disappeared? As long as we had arable land, factories, technical personnel, and other resources existed, we could build anything we wanted to build and fulfill most of our needs. The Venus Project advocates that with today's ingenuity, we could easily overcome scarcity, which, in, which, excuse me, which is the cause of most of our problems, such as war, corruption, and aberrant behavior. We could accomplish this by implementing a resource-based economy. This is very different than anything that's gone before. It has nothing in common with communism, capitalism, or fascism. To put it simply, a resource-based economy uses resources rather than money. And all people have free access to their needs without the use of money, credit, barter, taxation, or any other form of debt or servitude. In other words, all of the Earth's resources would be held as the common heritage of all the world's people. The real wealth of any nation is not its money but its resources and the people who work toward the elimination of scarcity for a more humane society for everyone. If this is still confusing to you, consider this. If a group of people were stranded on an island and they had gold, diamonds, money, but the island had no arable land, no clean water, and no fish, their wealth would be irrelevant to their survival. <laughs> Money is not what people need, but rather it's the necessities of life. In a resource-based economy, excuse me, in a resource-based economy, resources are used directly to enhance the lives of all people. <clears throat> if we manage resources wisely, we could easily produce the necessities of life and, pro and provide a very high standard of living for everyone. This may be hard to believe or understand, but even the wealthiest of today would have a much higher standard of living in a resource-based economy. When science and technology are unleashed into society to improve the lives of everyone without restrictions of money, the marketplace, or patents, we could then begin to know what it really means to be human. In a resource-based economy, children would be taught to be problem solvers instead of the parasitic professions used within the monetary system that don't contribute to the well-being of people. These would be fields such as advertising, insurance, 
real estate, law, politics, and sales. All those professions wouldn't be needed if we didn't use money. When all the Earth's resources are shared, there would be no need for the military. This savage profession could easily be surpassed within a resource-based economy. These people are merely trained to be killing machines. How wonderful it would be if they were sent back to school and trained how to be problem solvers instead, to learn how to bridge the difference between nations without violence. When all the Earth's resources are managed and shared as the common heritage of all the world's people, the artificial boundaries that separate nations would no longer be necessary. Invasion of countries purely for resource theft would be a thing of the past. And that's why we invade other countries. It's not to bring democracy and freedom as they tell us in the United States. In a resource-based economy, instead of fighting one another over scarce resources, people will be working towards solving problems that are common to everyone, such as the risk of cancer heart disease, tsunamis, and earthquakes. Remember that, most, that almost every new concept was ridiculed, rejected, and laughed at when it was first introduced, especially by the experts of the times. All new ideas for social betterment, including women's rights, black rights, child labor, have always been met with great resistance. For instance, during the time of the Wright brothers, the distinguished scientists of the day were writing books proclaiming why man can't fly. The Wright brothers didn't read their books and went right ahead and built the flying machine. When science is applied with human and environmental concern, to the way we live, we could easily create abundance for all. We will eventually understand that most criminals that fill our jails are a result of the need to acquire money and property in an age of often contrived scarcity of the monetary system. Children will look back and wonder why we couldn't see the limitations of this offensive system being civilized is an ongoing process. There are no utopias and no final frontiers. All things change and are in a continuous process of social, social evolution. Those countries that try and freeze things and keep things as they are will be surpassed. Thank you. one another. I'm going to try to prove it to you. Sometimes the person says, have a nice weekend. Why don't they say, have a nice life? Why just a weekend? <laughs> because you live in a world where language was designed without real meaning. Another proof of that. When you open the Bible, your friend says, this is what Jesus meant. Another person says, you're wrong. He meant that. And the third person says, you're both wrong. This is what he really meant. That's why you have the Lutheran, the Seventh-day Adventist, the Catholic, because the Bible is subject to interpretation. So is all language. When you talk to somebody, 
they really don't hear what you say. It goes into their head, gets messed around, and comes out a little different. Is it possible now to develop a language that's not subject to interpretation? Yes, it is. Mathematics, chemistry, when a chemist writes a formula, if it goes to Japan or Germany, it's not subject to interpretation. Engineering standards, when engineers talk to each other, they don't say, believe me, this is the strongest material made. They talk about its torsional strength, compression strength, tension strength, and they understand each other. When bridge engineers talk to each other, one doesn't say, I think the beams are this size, another one says, no, they're that size. You couldn't build bridges if the language was subject to interpretation. Our world, now this is because I respect the women here, is full of shit as a Christmas turkey. I talk to women as equals, I don't pull my punches. I want you to understand, today when a lady drops a pie, she says fiddly dee. The guy says shit, that means sorry I dropped the pie. That's all. There's no bad words. When a person says Bullshit means I can't accept what you're saying. It has nothing to do with the shit of a bull. <laughs> now, if you understand what I'm talking about, if you want to be honest with things, they say honesty is the best policy. Then when your children come up to you and they say, Mommy, where do babies come from? She says, the stork brings them. That's a lie. And on Santa Claus Day, they say Santa Claus brings you everything. Well, really, the parents and the relatives bring kids things they want them to have. But you start lying to kids, and in the States we have a tremendous lie called the Mickey Mouse Club. Imagine giving kids that kind of a notion of a Mickey Mouse worshipping a rat. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you that the world you live in is as full of shit as a Christmas turkey. All nations. All nations lie. Now, people think, well, some nations are good. My country, America, where do you think they got the land? They stole it from the Indians. They killed thousands of Indians, Americans. And they starved, they killed 50 million buffalo. But some Indians tried to fight back. So the government offered men 10 bucks for every Indian you killed. So a guy would walk over to the government and say, I just killed 10 Indians. And the government would say, how do I know that? Bring back a piece of the Indian. So they scalped them. That's where the scalping came from. Guy brought 10 scalps in, he got paid. So your country, my country, all countries do the same thing. They say the sun never sets on England. Where do you think they got all that land? You think people say, come, come to our land and take it away. Of course not. We are all basically corrupt. Now lawyers, there's nothing the matter with lawyers as long as they got their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> so the profession of law, banking, investment brokers, all gone in the future because they do nothing. Now you think, well, maybe politicians are all right. Well. Politicians say things people like to hear. That's what they have to say to get elected. Also, if the drug company comes up and says, hey, if you give us a hand, we'll put up $2 million to help you get elected. When you're elected, you owe favors to the drug companies. If the drug companies find out that uh, celery juice lowers blood pressure, why should they tell you that? When they can sell drugs for three bucks a piece, a little pill. So they don't do research for the benefit of people. They do research for the benefit of, of profit and nothing more. If your country loved you, which a lot of kids are brought up to believe in, if you serve in the army, that means you put your life up for your country. I think that if there is war and if you put your life up for your country, the country should subscript all the war industries so no one makes any money out of war. 
the jeeps, the airplanes, the aircraft carriers, no profit for the duration of the war, then the war is real. If you took the profit out of war, there'd be no war. What the hell do you think war is? You think we go to another country to bring democracy? We go there because there's oil, resources, or something we need. So, are people good or bad? Well, there's no such thing as good or bad people. If you're brought up in the South as a baby in America, and in some uneducated region, you might become a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And he might say things like this, I'm going to get me a nigger and I'm going to kick his ass. Is that him speaking or the way he was brought up? So you don't exist, really. The culture grabs you when you're very young and they pump crap into your head. What's the greatest country in the world? Poland, you know, wherever it is. They pump all that into your head. Who loves you more than anybody? Your mom and papa. Of course that's not true. People that treat you well and educate you and serve your needs really love you. Now the word love, another bullshit word. I'm going to try to sell it now. Don't get mad at me. Give me a chance to, to bring forth. I'm sure most of you do not like everything you've ever done. Is that right? You did stupid things in the past. You did things you're sorry about. So sometimes you love yourself very much. Sometimes a little less, and sometimes, how did I do that stupid thing? So love is a fluctuating thing. Even if you get married and you love the guy, sometimes you'll find out you love him that much, sometimes that much, sometimes how did I get into this? <laughs> so love is a fluctuating thing, not fixed. A lot of people lie about me. They say, Fresco receives money from the Vatican. He receives money from the one worlders, or he receives money from the banking institutions. They'll lie about anybody that's trying to affect change. You must expect that. If you get up and fight years ago for women's rights, you had rotten eggs thrown at you. Women were not allowed to vote in America. And when they fought against child labor in factories, the people that marched for it had rotten eggs thrown and they were beaten up by police. Police serve whatever nation is around. They don't give a shit about people. If a policeman really cared and you were driving fast, he'd say, pull over, and then he'd say, do you have a driver's license? And he shows it. He'd say, well, what's your hurry? He'd say, well, I think my kid's sick, or my boss said, if I come late again, I'll lose my job. He said, well, be careful, Mike Sharp. Think, isn't it where you learn to drive? Let me see you drive. These are bullies, not people. And people that work in prisons are very stupid as a rule. Now, when a man steals a watch worth 150 bucks, third time, third offense, they put him in jail for six years. You know how many watches that costs? Figure it out. You give him medical care, food for six years, it's cheaper to give him a watch. Think about it. <laughs> The management of your country and all countries are by stupid people, very stupid. Now, I don't want you to take my word for it. Walk over to any politician and say, how would you prevent cars from hitting each other? I don't know. How can you grow more food so people are well fed? Hmm, I don't know. How can you prevent war? I don't know. They don't know anything, believe me. They are businessmen. Another thing I want to say about politicians is that they do say things people like to hear. When people, most of them, believe the earth was flat, there was a time when they did. The politician would say, folks, the earth is a little round and a little flat, and you get along with everybody. It is not the business of science to get along with anybody. It's to tell the truth. If you believe the earth is flat, they show you all kinds of instruments and all the indications that make them believe it's round. So when I was a kid, I said, well, I, you know, I'm, some of you know I'm 94 years old. But when I was 21, I said, how are you going to change the world? So many different kinds of people. In the Arab world, the guy has six wives, and that's normal there. In other countries, they wear a bone through their nose. People are so different. 
How are you going to change them? And the first thing you have to learn to say, which is most, most difficult, I don't know. <laughs> so, I'm going to tell you what thinking is. Thinking is talking to yourself. When I say, I'll see you Saturday, he looks up and he says, I have to take the kids to Aunt Minnie Saturday, I can't see you. Thinking is nothing magic. It's talking to yourself. So in talking to myself, I said, how are you going to change the world? And I said, I didn't know. So I said, why don't you try to find out, find out if your system works? I said, yeah, that's a good idea. That's all. So, so I joined the Ku Klux Klan. How many of you knew that? And I dissolved it in a month and a half alone in Miami. There were about 32 members in that group. Then I joined the White Citizens Council. They hate foreigners, all foreigners. And I dissolved that in one month. Then I went to Brooklyn, and I came back from California into Brooklyn, and I asked a lot of people what the most backward people were in Brooklyn. They said, the Arabs that live in Atlantic Avenue. I said, what makes you think the Arabs are backward? They still believe the Earth is flat. So I thought, boy, if I can't change them, how am I going to change the world? So I called the leader. You always deal with the leader as a group. That goes for the clan, too. I called the leader. His name was Elbaz. He was an Arab, obviously. And he said to me, first thing on the phone, you are Arab, with that kind of face. I said, eh, that means yes in Arabic. I speak a little bit of many languages. So he said, from where your father he born? I said, Lebanon. He said, very good, come and saw me. Come and see me. So I came to see him, and he said to me, you believe the world is round? I said, yes. He went. <laughs> that means where he comes from, that makes sense. Can't be. So I said, he said, if the, he, he pointed to his head first to show me how smart he was. He went like this. Then he said, if the world he round, like that, man fall me down here. <laughs> All the water he fall me down from the world. <laughs> so I said, boy, if I can't turn that guy around, how am I going to turn the world around? So I gave him a balloon that I brought with me, and I rubbed it with fur real fast. I put cornflakes in his hand and told him to hold his hand away from the balloon. Does anybody know what happens if you rub a balloon? And and hold your hand on it with cornflakes, all the cornflakes jump up to the balloon. They're electrostatically attracted. And he scratched his head, his jaw hit the paper. <laughs> he said, world he magnet? I said, eh, ah! <laughs> and, and he explained that to all the other Arabs. In an hour and a half, I turned something they believed in all their lives. Now, of course, that's not easy to do with religion. Because I had two Catholic priests used to attend my seminars. And one of them said, the trouble with you, Fresco, is you want to make the world a better place. My kingdom is up there. I said, you want to read your Bible. Jesus said, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no money, no business, no private ownership. So I would say the Venus Party is the nearest thing to religion, but only it's not verbal, it's real. Now, they also say that when I went to religious schools, they told me God knows everything. He made every galaxy, every bug, every flower, every plant. And I thought, all right, maybe he does. But so why did Jesus insult God? The priest says, I don't remember Jesus insulting God. Well, here's what he did. It says in the Bible, just before Jesus was nailed to the cross, or crucified, he looked up and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And God said, gee, I never thought of that. Don't <laughs> you see how ridiculous that is? Telling God to forgive them, for they didn't know what they were doing, as though God didn't know that? 
And the way you say, it hadn't rained for years, my corn is drying up, I need rain. Dig a ditch and irrigate the area. <laughs> God said, by their work you shall know them, not their bullshit. And once you get in church, God, I need a new car, my wife needs a job. You're all, you're all dictating to God what to do. So man makes God in his own image. Some guy sitting on a throne that looks down at the world and says, if you don't behave yourself, I'm going to flood the whole damn thing. <laughs> now this doesn't sound like God that loves everybody. So he told Noah to build himself an ark and take two kinds of every animal. But of course they don't tell you where he got the polar bear and the giraffe. But let's say he got two kinds of every animal. If he did, the boat would be a mile long. Who cleans the shit out of that boat? <laughs> So, that's what I mean by everything has to change in the world because we live in a very old system. I'm not talking about technology. That's racing forward. But human values are the same. They're not moving. And I'm talking to you about a different kind of world where there's no crime, no serial killers, no hungry people, no armies, navies, police, or prisons. Well, they say man has always been evil ever since he was created. Now the story they tell us, God made a woman and a man and set them in a beautiful garden. And according to the Bible, snakes used to walk upright. They weren't, they didn't crawl, walk up. And the snake said, eat of the fruit of knowledge. Now man is curious. There was a woman named Eve. That's where evil came from. So she ate of the fruit. She ate the fruit because she wanted to know. And God kicked them out, shut the gates forever. Is this God? And then they also tell you, he loves you. <laughs> then he kicks them out. And then, of course, they tell you that he never does anything wrong. Well, heaven was a beautiful place until a couple of angels felt they'd like God's job. So he kicked them out, they call the fallen angels. You read your Bible, it says, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say Wednesdays and Thursdays you can kill. It says thou shalt not kill. It says love thine enemy. When a man strikes you, turn the other cheek. A rich man said to Jesus, can I enter the kingdom of heaven? He said the same chance a camel has going to the eye of a needle. So the rich man said, what do you want me to do? Give all your money, superfluous to your needs, to the poor. He said, no thanks. So the church, Jesus, chased the money changers out of the temple. Now they're all back in there. They run the whole show. I'm sorry about that. And we really need money. Well, Roxanne pointed out that if you came to an island with a million dollars of gold, and there was no water, no fish, nothing to eat. You have nothing. Money never meant anything. But they devised that as a control device. I'd say, I want you to paint my roof. He said, how much were you giving me? I said, five dollars. Ten dollars. Let me think about it. Fifteen dollars. He paints my roof. Money is a control device. If you paid your help three thousand dollars a week, you wouldn't see him Monday morning. They take their family out on a cruise. So they pay people minimum wage. You have to go back to work one day to pay the rent and the food. There's no love in that. Do you understand? They use words like love, peace, God bless everybody. In our country, America, Obama always closes all presidents. God bless America. Who the hell are you to tell God who to bless? Oh, so you live in a world that's extremely stupid, particularly army men. They're out there to defend the country. And the U.S. gave people in Hawaii radar, everything. And two <coughs> young Americans detected enemy planes coming, the Japanese planes. And they told the captain, he said, ah, there's probably our planes. So we paid no attention to it. Now that's true in all areas. 
you got a super defense system, cameras all over the place, and uh, believe me or not, the Arabs hijacked airplanes and flew them into the Twin Towers. Where's your defense? Where's your security? All I tell you today, at airports we got security. You come with a suitcase, they x-ray it. They x-ray you. But this is something I wouldn't do. I can design clothing that gives out nerve gas that can't be detected by x-rays. What every human being can think of, another human can think of another system out of that. There's no security. The world must learn to live together and work together. And instead of a pentagon in Washington of military people, we have a pentagon of sociologists, social scientists, who know how to bridge the difference between nations. Soldiers are killing machines. Of course, they don't know any better. They're brought up to be patriotic. When you fly over a city, you press a button and burn everybody in that city. Guy gets three medals, and everybody pats him on the back. That's why they do it. Even though they go to church on Sunday, they don't understand what they're reading. They don't understand their religion. Now, if some church gets three million dollars, they put a big chandelier in and build a new church. If they understood the teachings of Christ, they'd give all surplus, surplus money to the undeveloped churches, the poor, not the chandelier. So you've got ministers that are proud of their church. Pride is one of the seven deadly sins. Unfortunately, most religions sold out to the money system. Since Jesus chased the money changers out of the temple, if you don't understand me, when I say sold out, the Catholic Church in my neighborhood used to bless soldiers and throw holy water on war tanks. The, the Catholics in Italy were blessing their war tanks. How can you love a country? How can you be devoted to God and do these things? These people are living contradictions. If you still don't understand me, a Catholic walked into my office once and he says, I've come to find out what the Venus Project is about. I says, I wouldn't wear that cross if I were you. He said, why? He says, for God so loveth the world, he gave his only begotten son. The witnesses in the Bible say, Jesus was crucified, he arose and ascended into heaven. Where's the sacrifice? Think about it. No sacrifice. If you kill someone and he arrives, he goes back into heaven, there's no sacrifice. Besides, God can snap his finger and make all the Jesus he wants. <laughs> the things that people believe are unbelievable. <laughs> they are innocent, they don't know, because your schools do not teach you how to think. They teach you how to be a cog in the wheel a chemist, a lawyer, a structural engineer, but no generalist. If they taught you how to think, there would be no war. There'd be no abuse. And this is what we do with children. If you don't understand what I'm saying, I'll tell you the truth about my own little boy. When he was four years old, I used to read to him in bed. I never taught him to read. And then, I'd read about things kids like, you know, dinosaurs, things like that. And then, when the two dinosaurs met, I got out of, and I closed the book. He said, Daddy, what happened when the two dinosaurs? I said, look, if you learn to read, you can find out for yourself. <laughs> it's, it's really best not to teach your kids anything until they say, what keeps the moon up there? Then you go into it. Daddy, what makes a clock work? My kid said to me, Daddy, what makes an airplane fly? Is it the propeller? I said, if you don't have a motor turning that propeller, it wouldn't move. Is it the motor? If you don't put fuel in that motor, it wouldn't turn. Is it the fuel? If you don't have oxygen, the fuel wouldn't burn. Well, what is it? It's not one thing. It's many interacting variables. When they say to you, this person's bad, well, what the hell does that tell you? Nothing. It means that they didn't like something he did. If your mother says, you're a Catholic, you don't play with that little Lutheran girl. 
they start poisoning the well. Is it the mother's fault? No. They are not taught how to think in school. Then they give you words like, she's talented. Did you ever hear that? She's gifted. Like some people got some vibrations from outer space and they got wonderful ideas. The truth is, this is much harder to accept now, human beings, this includes me, cannot think or reason. If you, brought, if you want to test this, ask an Eskimo if he ever dreams of walking on a palm fringe beach. He said, what's that? <laughs> it's not what's in his realm. You ask an American Indian, you can have anything you want, what do you want? He doesn't say a twin engine beach craft. He doesn't ask for things like that, or Mercedes. He says a wigwam and a good bow and arrow. All people reflect their culture. They can never step out of their culture. Unless you lived in Germany three years, and in France three years, and in England, then you have a broader view. But when Americans usually go to France, they go to the American club, which you don't learn anything. They really don't understand. When I was 21, I tried to understand sex. I could not. So I got a job on a boat because I wanted to see what people would be like if they weren't educated. So I worked my way to Tahiti. By that time, the Chinese owned most of the stores, and there was money. So I wanted some out islands where the natives were very primitive. And I found a group of islands called Tuamotu, east of Tahiti, a thousand miles. And when I landed there on a boat, I worked on this banana boat, I landed there, everybody walked around naked. And I was confused, because where I came from, that was abnormal. The whole tribe was naked. They were swimming naked ever since they were little tots. What I found out is a guy talking to a girl never looked at the girl's body, only the eyes. Since they were swimming naked, there's no basis for looking at a girl. There were no peeping toms. Do you understand that? If everybody swims nude, nobody's going to look in your window and watch your dress. Nobody's going to poke another guy and hey, get a load of that chick. All that's learned by this stinking culture. All your books on sex are bullshit, they're lies. Because the way we're brought up makes us look at things. If you cover the girl's nose, says the guy, did you ever see a girl's nose? No, show him a little bit. He may have to loosen his car <laughs> if he's brought up to that. I'm trying to tell you the world is wrong. I'm one person. Most of you people seem to take to that. This is happening all over the world. Peter Joseph said, there's 50 million people that now know about the Venus Project. And more people want to know more about it. I'm trying to free you from the prisons that your state puts in your head. That's what I'm trying to do. The success rate so far has been very high. I want to tell you some more about, about human beings. Somebody said to me, because I mentioned that love was a fluctuating thing, he said, do you love your mother? I said, in what area? My mother was a racist and a bigot, but I didn't love her in that area. So love is never consistent. You love certain things about people, never completely, any more than you completely love yourself. So I, I learned that when I brought a Japanese kid home one day, a friend of mine. I brought him home, my mother says, I don't want that kind around. So I used logic and reason. It didn't work at all. All the good books says use reason, common sense. Doesn't work. My mother says, I still don't want him around. I said, boy, if you can't change your mother, how are you gonna change the world? <laughs> well, I said, that's right. So I told my mother a lie. I said, Mother, I was swimming in the East River, and the East River has a high wall, and I couldn't get ashore, and I was drowning. And Masato, this isn't true, he threw a life raft to me. She said, oh my God, you mean he saved your life? I said, yes. I was so rude to him. I said, yes, you were. <laughs> she said, please, Jock, ask him to come to dinner Friday or so. I want to beg forgiveness. I was so rude to him. I said, I don't know if he'll come now to get her to plead with me, because she pleaded more. 
So I called my father and said, the minute you come in the door, my mother's going to say, God bless you, I want to kiss you and hug you for saving my son's life. Well, at dinner, she was really talking to him. And I walked over when Osato went to the washroom. I said, Mother, what do you think? She said, you know, he's just like you and I. He's a human being, wonderful parents in Japan. I said, remember the yellow race with his face. And she said, he doesn't matter. He's a nice boy. I said, yeah, but he's slanty-eyed. And she said, that doesn't matter. He's a human being. And she's giving me all the stuff I used to give her. And now, after about a month, she really liked Masato. He was a nice guy. He's easy to like. He spoke perfect English, had no Japanese mannerism, none of this sort of thing. And she used to put her arm around Masato about a month later and call him son and me. Once that happened, I said, Mother, he never saved my life. She said, you little devil. <laughs> I would have never opened the door. I would have never opened the door. Which means that some people can't follow reason. So, how did I change the clan? I didn't do it with logic or reason. I got to know the, the head guy of the clan. Because he once said to me, he had a war surplus store, and I used to buy magnifying glasses and things like that. He said to me, Jock, you're a smart guy, what do you think of the KKK? I mean the Ku Klux Klan. He said, yeah. So I said, it's a great organization, but it doesn't go far enough. What do you mean? But if you attack, you don't get the ear. Always it's a great organization, but it doesn't go far enough. Then what do you mean? See? So I began to tell him what I meant. He said, what do you do with all the lenses you buy from me? I said, well, I work on optical devices. He said, can I see it? I took him to my lab, and I showed him a lot of things, including memory metals. How many of you know about that? Metals with a memory. About one hand, about seven to eight, about eight people know about it. There are metals today that have a memory. Now here's what that means. If you buy wire, and you wrap it around a form, and heat it to about four to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, it it stays that way. It, it looks like a spring, but if you pull it out, bend it, twist it, do anything you want, and heat it, it goes right back to the shape that you made it in. So that means if you took the memory metals, and nowadays they have memory fabrics, sutures for suture, sewing up the skin. So the doctor ties a surgical knot, then he pulls it out straight, and he sticks it through the skin, when he cuts it. And the heat of the body causes it to tie a surgical knot. But you have to tie the surgical knot first and then pull it out. So if you have a continuous stitching and you pull it out, it'll stitch the whole area. Now, I wish I brought some of that with me, some of the memory metals. Uh, but how did a man think of it? He didn't. There was a Swede that mixed different metals together. He was just trying to make metals stronger. And he used titanium and nickel. It's called nickel and titanium. And he bent it to see how strong it was, like the letter U. And he put it on a table near a heat lamp. And when he came back, it was straight again. See, nobody really invented anything. It was all discovery. In France, a guy made a wing three feet long and strapped it on his back. And he climbed up the top of the Eiffel Tower and he jumped off and he died. And his brother-in-law wrote, make wings larger next time. <laughs> Where do you think it comes from? Nobody can, can know how to build an airplane right away, and nobody ever makes a mistake in their life. They don't know. So the guy that had nitric acid and glycerin, he was fooling with it, and the, the building disappeared, so did the guy. His cousin wrote, never fool with that stuff. There, nobody ever makes a mistake, because Edison said he went through 7,000 different things before he could get a filament for the lamp. Did he make mistakes before? No. We don't know. That's, that's the truth. So today they say there are good people, bad people, 
lazy people, hard-working people, no such thing. Everybody is shaped by culture. Now, I'm going to give you the worst scenario, a serial killer. I want to show you a guy that killed 20 women or so. What's the matter with that guy? Is there anything wrong with his head? Not necessarily. I'm going to try to tell you what made him that way. If you don't understand me, at the question period, question it. When this kid, Albert Fish, who was believed to have eaten 45 children or so, uh, when he was about seven years old, he was sitting in bed touching his private parts, his penis. Now, kids don't think of sex or anything, he's just touching it. His mother was an old-time Baptist. She came and said, you're going to burn in hell touching that part of your body. You will burn eternally. And the kid started to shake. And at night, the mother says at two in the morning, he was screaming. She came into the room, he stuck needles into his genitals, screaming in pain, because he didn't want to go to hell. So he used to take minority kids in the woods and try to cut their genitals off to save them from hell. Is he bad? Is he good? He's shaped that way by that abnormal culture he was raised in. That's what makes people that vile. They come from the South, say, I'm going to get me a nigger and I'm going to kick his ass. Is that that guy speaking? Or is that what he learned in the culture that he lived in? Think about it. There are no bad people. A Ku Klux Klan man that hangs a black man upside down, cuts him open because they're taught that the black man is nothing. He has no meaning at all. In fact, it's a good thing to do. What do you think a soldier is? They show him pictures of Japanese sneaking around, killing people, gang raping girls, and the enlistment goes up 75%. All people, all people need clean air, clean water, a good education, and love and warmth. So they're not bad people. They tell you the Filipinos are bad. The goddamn Greeks are no good. You know, all the way down the line. And so that's how a country keeps its people patriotic, by pointing out the shortcomings of other people. But they're all nuts. They all live in the past. They all don't understand anything. And what I'm trying to tell you is that we need a different kind of world. So I will open this session to questions. And please, don't be polite. If there's anything you don't understand, say, I'll get it. And if, I, if you ask me a question, if I don't answer it, say, you didn't answer my question. Okay. Yes. Is it possible to abolish or to, for not the human being to work, you know, to do something? Well, when I was a kid, there used to be a man called the Ice Man. He used to bring ice. He's gone. The refrigerator put him out. When I was a boy, a little boy, women used to operate elevators. They turn a little crank. They never quite got to the floor. Today, a plus twenty <whistles> takes you down. No people in the elevators. If you go to any modern airport today, there's no people in the train, no operator, no conductors. It stops exactly. The door is open and the train is without people. So industry, the automobile industry, used to have thousands of people working there. If you've seen films on it, machines pick up the car, put the wheels on it. The people are being moved out. I don't know if that answers your question. Eventually, all markets will have, instead of cashiers, automatic registration of food and pricing. And if you didn't drop your money in the slot, your food won't come to you. So it's, it's people like a... are being replaced by machines. Can you replace architects and engineers? It takes about an hour and a half to make a laptop that can do the work of an engineer. Engineers will be out 15 years now. So if you're going to school studying engineering, Move into robotics. It'll help you. So lawyers will be out, because you can make, don't forget, a lawyer has a library. And when he's not sure of something, he looks up how a case was handled. And it's very easy to put that in a laptop. What do you do in this case? A laptop will tell you. Today, with a laptop, 
Maybe it's 300 bucks for a laptop, but you're in touch with the world. You can find out anything. You can ask about the memory metals. We can do the same thing with law, with business management. All these people that think they have steady jobs. There's no such thing as a steady job. Even a, uh, a guy called a dermatologist that studies skin disease, when he goes to medical school, they show him pictures of psoriasis, measles, scarlet fever, all different, and he's got to remember them. When he looks at your hand and sees a new pattern, he goes like this. That means he's not sure. He's, Dr. Jones, can you come in here and look at this? That guy has been around the world. So, oh, that's a form of Jamaican malaria. It's very easy to do that technically. Photograph every skin disease, hold it up in front of a scanner. It'll scan it and give you the latest treatment by the best brains of the world, not a single doctor. Do you understand? It's very easy to repeat and replicate any profession. So in time, people will not work. They go to work, they think, well, that's the way you earn a living. No, it's not. It's the only way we use today. But in the future, work will be considered beneath man. Because man has a brain. When you put a girl behind a counter in a department store for 15 years, what can I do for you, ma'am? We have tangy lipstick, hair lotion. <laughs> you know what you got up here when you retire? Hair lotion, tangerine, all this crap. That's not using her brain. When you work in this jewelry store and you stand there all day hoping people come in and buy something, that's not using your brain. So all that will be automatically dispensed. It's very easy to do. Work is beneath people. It serves no useful purpose, except if a guy is a surgeon, you break your arm, he can rebuild it. But even that, eventually. I want to tell you something else before your next question. Uh, they say you can't be two places at the same time. I think you've heard that. Frank Sinatra died years ago, and he sings he's thousands of places at the same time. So all your little old calendar bullshit is worthless. When a man says, I will never get to the moon, he talks to his hat. He just say, I don't know enough about what, what a man can get to the moon. I know nothing about rockets, nothing about space travel. I don't know. Yes. Uh, um, let's take another person, and if we have time after that, we'll come back to you, because a okay. lot of other people want to ask. We'll try and get back to you. First of all, good afternoon, Mr. Jack Fresco. Um, uh, I would like to an ask you something that has been, well, on my mind ever since I saw the movie. Um, how, how is the power managed in Zeitgeist Society? I mean, how does the establishment that will organize society work? Who is running things? Who makes the decisions? Is that yes. The question? Uh, oh. Uh, he, he, because you say that there are needs for politicians, but there's always a need for some sort of leaders who will manage even the scientists and the architecture, the architects and those people who I will manage human question. resources. I really understand it. You tell me if I don't, okay? I said no one makes decisions in the Venus Project. Here's how it works. We take samples of the soil from, say, let's, we're dealing with America, all over America. We send the soil to Central Agriculture as a research center. There they analyze the soil. And by the contents of that soil, they tell us it's best to grow beets for four years than rotate the sugarcane. That's not an opinion. That's a finding. Do you know the difference? So today they bring you up and say everyone should have a right to their own opinion. We say no one will have a right to their own opinion. They'll have access to information. If you ask people those questions, you don't get answers. First, first of all, there has to be enough people to agree that they want to move in this direction. It's a specific agenda. And um, then what we have to do is take a survey of the Earth's resources. We have to learn what we have first. We have to learn where the population is. We have to learn where the technical personnel and the factories are initially. We have to know where the diseases, the diseased people are. That in turn dictates where the cities are built, where arable land is, 
where hospitals have to be built and what types of hospitals. So it's nobody making decisions over people. Decisions are arrived at by the needs of the society and the direction that we want to move towards. And for instance, you wouldn't go to a baker to when you want to build a bridge. You go to the people who are gathered, multidisciplinarians, to put up the bridge. They have to scan the area, see how much bedrock, see what the land is like, see what the spans is like, see what the land under the water is like. And that dictates the type of bridge that's built, depending on the resources and the materials we have, but not the money, not people making decisions as they do today. Yes, but, uh, but still, uh, making the, the point, making the, the right decision, um, how do you face the fact that there's at least, well, in my little mind conception, uh, that there is a, a certain sense for leadership, for who will be managing all the resources, will there be separate, uh, separate groups of people, who will be not you the You want master? the answers? Okay, hang on. Um, what we do first, if, if you do a survey of a, oak, of a certain state, how much arable land there is, you know what that means? How much water there is, that tells you how big a population can live there. Not you. I can't go in and say I'm going to build a city of 50,000 people. First you survey, see if there's water, arable land, road material. So no one makes decisions. They arrive at them by doing a study of the situation. You know, the government asked scientists, can you put a man on the moon? And they said, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? They said, we don't know what a man can stand. What do you mean by that? We have to put him in a centrifuge and whirl him around. If he conks out at nine times gravity, that's the speed you, can, you can't take off too fast because everybody would die. So they have to do a study to find out. If you want to put up a building a half a mile high, you've got to make a concrete mixture that can stand that load. And when they make a concrete mixture, they put it in the machine and push. And if it can stand that load, that's what they use. They arrive at decisions. They don't make decisions. Normal people make decisions. Scientists have to arrive at it. That's what we mean by the scientific methods applied to the social system. Oh, uh, thank you for your answers. Just one follow-up. How do you distinguish if it's a right? Just one follow-up on this. How do then you ensure that you distinguish between a, a decision which is arri arrived or a decision which has been made? How do you ensure that you, we okay. can distinguish? I think I got it. Well, let's just take, I have to give you an example, excuse me. If a man or a woman designs an airplane with swept forward wings, and another one designs it with swept back wings, who decides which is built? Is that the kind of question? Okay, we built both, because we don't know. We want to find out how far forward, how far back, how planes behave with wings swept back or swept forward. Why do you have to decide this or that? You know what I mean? In a resource-based economy, the people are telling me organic food is better than food that's genetically altered. So we try them. If it doesn't work, we stop it. If the buildings fall on people in an earthquake, we design them with tapered walls without ornaments hanging on there that fall on people. In other words, a person says, well, my brother-in-law died, he was sitting in bed smoking, and he dropped his cigarette and fell asleep. We have all our beds made of foam. It's not foam rubber, but inside there are bubbles of CO2 gas. So if you dropped a cigarette on the bed, it would put it out. There are no signs in the Venus Project. Drive carefully, school crossing. I'm sure you've seen that sign. Okay, well, here's what we have. When the kid wants to cross the street, he presses a button. But there's a gate. He can't walk till the gate opens. The pavement looks like a comb. When he presses the button, it turns up like that, so no car can hit a kid. Is that clear? All cars, you know what a proximity device is? The cars have a gadget on them that send out sound to get feedback. So if you got mad at me, you couldn't drive your car into my car. It would stop 40 feet away. That's what I mean by technology. 
our problems are no longer political, they're technical now. Everything that you have, your electric light, your automobile, your airplanes, are all technical. Did any politician ever give you anything technical? I don't know of anyone. So when you think about it, everything, your eyeglasses even, are made by optometrists that examine your eyes, or ophthalmologists who know something about the eye. But politicians know something about nothing. They never did. Now, George Washington, who's America's first president, had 300 slaves. Did you know that? If you knew that, he'd be arrested today and put in prison. So all the people you admire, King Solomon, he had a thousand wives. Oh, he's a great man, King Solomon. Today he'd be arrested as a bigamist. <laughs> so all the people you admire are bums and hooligans. I hate to say this, but they are worthless people. They contribute nothing to society. Most of the people, your movie actors, Television joke count, kids taking, making jokes, football players, hey, they earn more money than, than the people that gave us life, like Louis Pasteur. He, he enabled us all to live by doing his work. Maybe we'd all be dead if it wasn't for him. But what have you got in your par parks? Cannons, war tanks in front of schools, airplanes, bombers. What the hell kind of society do you live in? You should have statues of all the people that prevented childbirth fever, you know what I mean? Malaria, scarlet fever. Those are the real people that keep you alive. So in the future, everyone will live very well. I'm not talking about a society where you give out handouts, where you just get by. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying to you that the middle class American, I don't know too much about this country, lives better than kings. He has telephone in his car, he has television in his car, air conditioning. No king ever had that. But if you turn science loose, not making nuclear weapons or submarines or crap like that, making things better for people, bridging the difference, in 10 years we can change the surface of the earth to beautiful gardens. We'd have no parks. All this city would be immersed in lovely gardens with waterfalls. Why? Because the smarter people are, the better educated, the richer the world. If you can't afford to go to college, that's a crime against humanity. Any kid that wants to go to school and study anything should be permitted to do that, just like you give machine guns to soldiers. You give them cannons, airplanes, whatever the hell they want. They can fly over a village and wipe it out. And you admire that guy. I used to work for the head of the German Air Force at Roosevelt Field. His name was Ernst Judet, and he shot down 70 airplanes. And I said, how did you shoot down 70 airplanes? He said in a heavy German accent, it was very easy. I said, but how did you do it? I'd fly above the squadrons, and I'd look down at the rookies that couldn't maneuver too good and pick them off. That'd be a son of a bitch in your terms. <laughs> you know, but to the world, he's a hero. Same for Eddie Rickenbacker. He's the same technique. So when you don't know these things about, look, Harry S. Truman, you know what he, the President Truman? He owned a hat shop. He was a hat salesman. What the hell is he doing in Washington? The people in Washington should be at the forefront of technology, know the latest things. They tell women to write your congressman if you want women's rights. Well, why the hell do you have to write that jackass? If you get in an airliner today, you don't have to write the pilot and say you've been flying at an angle, straighten up. He knows his business. Even the navigator knows how to get you to Hawaii or wherever you're going. You don't have to write them. When you travel on an ocean liner, the captain knows how to get you there. But who the hell are these people that you have to write to that don't seem to know anything? So I've always spoken this way, even the politicians. And one politician said, Jock, if you convince too many people too fast like that, he says, the government might pick you up. I said, how do they do that? So all we do is put drugs in your car, Jock. It's easy. And then we pick you up. And your friends will say, you know, there was something strange about Fresco anyway. 
<laughs> they can do whatever they want. They can say, I get a check from the Vatican, or I get a check from the Atheist League of America, whatever it is. Uh, they do that, and they lie about anybody that they want to smash. Just remember that. So when that happens, it's to be expected. Question? Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so yeah. I want to thank you for coming to Portugal, and thank you all the people in here. Huge success today. We weren't expecting that many people in here, so thank you for coming all. I have uh, one short question. Uh, we uh, know all about the human replacement in production and distribution <coughs> of services, but we also assist uh, the, re the replacement of humans in, um, in calculation. And uh, my question is, what about um, the place of the machines in the calculations? I mean. Um, we are existing of the replacement in, uh, of humans for calculation of mathematics, uh, super calculators like computers. Uh, what about them? What about the, the, the place of the human ca calculating uh, things um, like such for, for architecture or, or such areas? Also, also, I have another oh, short right. question. Oh. Okay, okay. What about um, people being ca replaced as calculations uh, for calculations in s something like architecture? Okay. <clears throat> if architects are become machines in the future, <clears throat> what will people do? No, he's asking, how do you? You asking we are, how we are, do you we replace are giving architects? We are giving. We are giving. We are giving. Architects? Is that what yeah. you're saying? I, I, I will remake my question. We are giving calculators to, to children uh, in today's schools, and we do not, we do not know uh, the implications of that. So we do know that uh, children are less, um, um, have less abilities to calculate, uh, to make faster calculations. So what about the implications of that? Once you have machines take over things such as calculations, like children today don't have that ability, what's the implication of that? Okay. You know, <clears throat> when I was a kid, pilots would look out of an airplane and they'd say, I'm about a mile high. You understand what I'm and saying? clear your throat. <clears> they <throat> say, I'm about a mile high. Today, there's radar. It goes down and tells you you're 5,340 feet, six inches off the ground. No human can do that, and it's safer not to, we're not throwing the human out, we're putting that in airplanes today because man can't do that. Now today, there's thousands of problems. Government or man, according to physio physiologists, can handle seven things at one time. Computers can handle 1,000 trillion bits of information per second. So government would have its electrical tentacles in the production, transportation, agriculture. They will not control people, these machines. Just the production of goods and services. So you'd be able to live the life of Riley. You can go to school, do anything you want to do. This is if we let science go full blast, this is what will happen. What will happen to people? They'll study art, painting, sculpture, music, write plays, and travel all over the world. I doubt whether many of you have traveled very far beyond your own country. So for the first time, there'll be hundreds of sailboats that you don't own, but they're there for your use. People don't want to own anything. They want a bicycle when they want it. So we have thousands of bicycles lined up for your use. When you get where you want to go, you can leave it there. Today, there are millions of automobiles parked for eight hours. They don't need a rest. So when the people come out of the factory, they take the automobiles, but they live near where they work. If you live in some town that they built, you have to take your kids to school that way, shopping is the other way, the dentist is that way. If you design a city, all cities, with hospitals, everything people need in that city, and they live nearby, but there are trees so arranged that you can't see another house. You can't see buildings, lovely gardens, waterfalls, flowers. Why do you have to live 
an hour away from work. You drive all the way to work, and work is a pain in the ass for most people. They don't enjoy it. Very few people have a job that they like. In the future, all boring jobs, all monotonous jobs, are easy to automate. But there are some jobs that are not easy to automate. So they'll go on by humans until such a time as, you know what nanotechnology is? Nanotechnology is taking molecules, atoms, and arrange them in different molecular structures. That means they'll be able to make beans, meat, anything by arranging molecules without killing animals. We'll be able to do fantastic things, make gold, everything, because all things are made of molecular structures of atoms. And I asked a nanotechnologist, how far away is it? They said 15 years. Let's say it's 30 years away. We can make anything we want without a price tag. The price tag is based on scarcity. Now, if you made a tire that lasts 40 years, good rich may buy that tire, but they won't make it. Do you understand why? They put them out of business. If you have a method of producing goods and services faster than my factory, but you're a nice guy, if you share your ideas with me, you lose the competitive edge. So you keep it to yourself, you patent it, right? That deprives people all over the world of the advantages that you have to offer. You understand? The money system is the cruelest, foulest system ever conceived second to war. War is the worst. That's the supreme failure of nations to understand how to solve problems. We don't have to kill other people. We can invite all nations in and share all the Earth's resources. There's more than enough to take care of everybody. They can all live very well. I'll take the next question. I have here uh, just a question here on your left side, please. I have just a question. Is important for us, how can we help the Venice Project now and from now on? How can we help you, Jack and Roxanne, uh, on your projects? Well, first we'd ask you to learn about it. Um, we have books and videos on our website. If you can't get those, the website for the Venus Project and the zeitgeistmovement.com are very extensive. There's a lots of information. We have free download e-books and lots of movies and videos on the, on, the, um, on the website. So essentially learn about it so you can answer questions well for people. We have over 70 pages of frequently asked questions on the site as well. And then try and go out and talk to people about it because it's, it's spreading very quickly by word of mouth. That's what we have right now because we don't have access to major newspapers or televisions or radios. And, um, See if you can go out and do lectures about this. Introduce it to different groups. See how to work and introduce these things to, to different types of people. And join the movement here, because they're doing things in unison with, uh, with each other and with other Zeitgeist chapters all over the world. It's growing very quickly. And if you write music, write music about the Venus Project. If you write poetry, do the same. If you draw and paint, do it in relation to the Venus Project somehow so you can spread, spread the word. And if you write magazine articles, do it that way. Or send to, the, the Zeitgeist Movement has a lot of things that you can join, such as the, um, I don't know what it is, oh, the communication groups where they try and work together to write to different magazines, newspapers, different people that they target that might be might have sympathy with this direction. So any way you can do it, you know, work towards it, but also learn about it. That's the most important thing. What we would like to do next is a major motion picture. If you're in that field, great, talk to us. We'd like to do a major kind of an entertaining film to the general public, the Zeitgeist films are wonderful. They reach certain kinds of people, but they're over the heads of, of the general public in different ways. We need different films to reach different types of people. So if you're into film, that's really the best way to reach people. So the film we want to do it shows what life is like in a resource-based economy, and then shows flashbacks of how you get from here to there. And then hopefully at the end of the film, 
We'd love to be able to be in the place where we're breaking ground for the first city. So first that, that's the direction. City. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I had this question. It has been argued that totally new cities is the sole solution for the Venus project physical construction. It has been said to be quicker and easier. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if the core principles of the Venus project cannot or should not be implemented within our existing cities or at least some of them. Frank Zappa once said, home is where the heart is. He, he wants to know if the Venus... Uh, I didn't finish the advantage yet. of the Venus project cities, if, if they should be incorporated in the existing cities. Wait, wait, wait just, just to finish the question. Um, home is where the heart is. To strip the heart away from a person will probably kill her. For instance, the city I live in, which is Lisbon, has been growing and transforming for more than a thousand years. People get attached to what they call a home. And to destroy that is to take out a dear part of our being. Now the question is, why is it so important to build everything anew if the changes that? required to implement the Venus project are mainly of the social and scientific nature? Okay, I'm going to drive up to your house, take away all your electric No, that's not his question. And give you kerosene oil. That's not his question. He's saying, why does the Venus project need to do new cities? Home right. is where the heart is. He's saying, why can't we implement it in today's cities, the because Venus Project? You, when you look at a city, it's spread out. It's inefficient. It uses a lot of energy waste because buildings are different sizes. There's no plan. The roads wind all over the place. Trolley cars and buses travel at the ground level. They have to stop at every corner, spewing poison gas out the back of the cars. All over the world, there's traffic lights. And these cars stop, they're jammed, they louse up the environment. You, the cost of your cities could be saved by designing cities that are cost efficient and more humane. Don't you see your cities have accidents? We have proximity devices so cars can't hit, people can't be burnt in a fire, because everything in the building is fireproof, you need no fire engines. In other words, uh, when you say, why can't we go back to the charming days when we lived in the city and learned to like it? That's why I said, if I go to your house and take out all the electric lights and give you a gas light and kerosene lamp, you'd like that, if you're brought up with that. But today, you want electric lights. You don't want a kerosene lamp. You don't want a gas lamp. When it blew out, the whole family died in the old days. Did you know that? Because compared to the cities that even Jacques is designing, you are living in the past like they did 3,000 years ago or 300 years ago. The, the direction of the Venus Project is, produce, is to produce a very high standard of living for everyone all over the globe. And if you say you want to maintain these cities that are a tremendous cost in terms of resources and energy, and the health of people with the pollution and the dangerous areas and the very high cost of waste disposal, then you're depriving other people of a higher standard of living. You can get conditioned to anything. Let me ask you yeah. Do you have a laptop, sir? I do. Do you have a laptop? Yes, I do. You do? I'm surprised that you don't keep a pad. Anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I have to leave. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, to Roxanne and Jacko. Can you hold the mic closer to your mouth? We can't quite hear you. Yeah. Okay. So first, so just some first, uh, so my first word would be to thank you both, Roxanne and Jack. To actually be in Portugal, I realize it's the first time Jacques Fresco is visiting our country, so please feel at home. And I hope you enjoy your stay. It's a, it's a privilege for most of us, if not all, to actually meet you here. Now, thank you. Thank you. 
Um, just two questions, which I'll put in one question, and I hope I get answer to both. It's been over 30 years that your amazing ideas are trying to get some, to see the light. Um, Fresco, if you look back, um, I'm sure there were moments that maybe you invested time and um, strength in one direction to pull through, and maybe things didn't work out the way you planned because you were dealing with human beings with different agendas. If there's anything that, that you could tell people to go in particular directions to see your ideas through, what would be your um, friendly warning? I mean, is there anything that we should learn from your past experience so that we don't go in the same um, difficult areas or difficult directions? Is there some, some fields that we should avoid? Is there any particular lobby that we should be aiming for? I mean, is there anything that we can learn directly and just please tell us where not to go and just move forward in a particular direction that maybe over 30 years you've Is learned so far. Is there anything you can advise from um, your past that you can help people not to make same mistakes that you might have made and tell, tell them where to go? Because mainly I believe we're dealing with a mountain of issues that go beyond what people might agree with you or not. And no. the second part of the question is... Um, One question. I, I haven't finished. <laughs> I haven't finished. Uh, I can recommend certain books. They're on our website. One is called Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase. That's one. Language and thought and action goes into when politicians speak, they say America, blah, 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 blah. War, blah, 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 blah. They don't say anything. Just make noises. You should be proud to be a Filipino. Say, just noise, no information. When a teacher says to a kid, that's wrong, those words have no information. Think about it. When you say to a kid, that's wrong, he doesn't know what's wrong. But if, you, if he spells cat with a K, and you say, very close, we just change the K, except in certain countries where they use K, to a C. And he comes around with the C facing the wrong way, say, much closer. Isn't it? It's much closer than spelling it with a K. So you don't ever use language that, that's not what I told you. There's no information in those words. You just say your landing gear is too short, the propeller will hit the ground. Stuff like that is information. Where did I get that from? Years ago, I wanted to know how airplanes fly. Of course, I asked my parents, they didn't know. My relatives, they didn't know. So I went to the library. But this is years of frustration. I wanted to know that very, how can you fly on this thin stuff? And when I got the book, I opened it with great anxiety. I went to the library, it was called the Wright Brothers. And it starts out with, it was a sunny day in May, and Mrs. Orville Wright was hanging clothing on the line. That bothered me, no end. I want to know how planes fly. I didn't want to know about the sunny day in May. That whole book was sunny day in May. Near the end of the book, they killed the pigeon, and they put wires in its wings to keep them out, and they moved the wings forward, backward, to find the center of balance. That was information. I had to plow through all that bullshit to get to that one point. So I learned how to read books and scratch the bullshit. And just like if a doctor made a wonderful contribution to medicine, I didn't want to know that he lived in Palos Verdes, he has three children, Janet, Jennifer, and Matt Mildred. I didn't want to know that. And the doctor loved to play golf. Who the hell gives a shit? I just wanted to know what he did. So in the books of the future, they'll tell you what a person did. If you want to know about the guy, that'll be on the bottom. There's so much information in the world today, we cannot afford Sunday day in May. Do you understand that? Now, writers get paid by the amount of books they write amount of words they can stick in the book. Well, that's commercial, and that takes it away from information. And I had a, I was teaching a course, a five-year course, and the students were learning it in one month. And the principal came out and he said, hey, Jock, this is a five-year course. That means he doesn't give a shit about people. He's just interested in the money. Now, 
to prove that your government doesn't care about you, cigarettes would not be available in any sane society. Cigarettes always, not sometimes, always produce cancer in 15 or 20 years. It takes time. So telling kids not to smoke, we would show movies of a guy dying of choking of cancer. We would show fresh lung tissue that stretches. After you've been smoking for 20 years, it tears when you pull on. We show people gasping for breath, dying of cancer, real film. That's the best way to say no to drugs. Now what the hell is that? Some pinhead wrote that. The wife of President, what was his name? Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Nancy Reagan said no to drugs. What a stupid woman. That doesn't work. That doesn't do anything. You have so many stupid people in government, powerful people in the Army and Navy. I want to tell you a little bit about President Truman. Oppenheimer and Einstein went to see Truman, and they said, now that we have the atom bomb, please don't drop it on Japan. Drop it 30 miles off the coast. Say we have a terrible weapon. We'd rather not use it. Please surrender. And Truman said, I don't want those bums here anymore. And he dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They won't forget that. You killed all these thousands of people in a few seconds. Now, don't you think that's going to have a memory in the, in the race? The Japanese people won't forget that. You drop bombs on cities and burn the people down there. That's not the answer to problems. That's an answer 500 years ago. But today, there are better ways of doing things, believe me. The books I recommend, The Tyranny of Words, Language and Thought and Action, Semantics, General Semantics by Korzybski, called Science and Sanity. These are the books. If, you, if you've got a good memory, good. If you don't, write it down. Tyranny of Words. Well, there, we have a book list on our website. It's all there under the free downloads. They're also on the Zeitgeist Movement site. And if you're really interested in th phenomena, the book is called Unusual Phenomena. That means there were skin diseases that people had years ago that were fluorescent, and the whole top of the head would glow. And they thought they were saints, the ignorant people. There are many fluorescent bacteria that cause skin disease. Sometimes it happens in the ocean when the waves break, it's fluorescent. If you run along the beach, you leave fluorescent footprints. When the guy has scalp disease, they thought he was the same because they had a halo around his head. In other words, many ignorant people still prevail in religion. It isn't religion that's bad. You know, uh, there were many people in the world that were very bright, like Larry King. He said once said to me, Jock, what do you think of Christianity? I said, it's a wonderful idea. When are they putting it into practice? <laughs> so I'll just take three more questions. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elena. I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm studying the Venus Project for the last five years, so I know everything about it. Uh, my question is, uh, if I'm a best friend of uh, the director of IEEE, International European Engineering, um, how can you sell me this? How can you convince me to work for you? Because I'm fighting with these stubborn people for the last five years, and I have no idea how to convince them to work for this, to explore this. Yeah. She wants to know how to get engineers to support this. Engineers will never support this until they're thrown out of work. Only when people lose their homes, their jobs, do they give a damn about anything. Otherwise, they really don't care. But Unfortunately, we... I'm not wishing this, but people have to lose their jobs, their homes, and confidence in the people they elected to political office. Then they're ready for something new. I don't know what propelled you guys to come here. Maybe you saw the Zeitgeist film or something. But engineers, and successful people in this system like to keep things the way they are. But those who have done a little bit more reading and have had a little bit more exposure, we have hundreds, th thousands of people, professionals. We have a professional database of engineers, 
architects, you know, the rocket scientists who have signed up on our database who want to help us when we're, we're ready to do the first so city or anything. So basically, the Venus, to work for Venus Project is a hobby, right? Because I have to work during the day for IEEE, and at night, well, as a hobby, I can work for you because I need money, we're all, right? We're all prostitutes in this system. <laughs> <laughs> we have to make money to survive. But there, there are hundreds and hundreds of people who are volunteering and working with us. We have a, uh, the Venus Project Design Team website, thevenusprojectdesign.com, which unfortunately right now has been hacked into, so it's down for a little while. But um, they are organizing animators, and animators are volunteering, hundreds of them, to do, Jacques has thousands of designs that span the gamut all through society, and they're animating them right now. So, and, and CAD people are drawing them. So there are different people who are volunteering at this time to do different things. So uh, if I already explored more or less Europe from this point of renewable energy point of view, what can I do to be a volunteer and to join you in this engineer team? Well, sign up on the database right now, you know, the first thing, because um, we're not building right now, but we're looking for funding and we're looking for help in exactly. that direction, whether it's funding or resources. But there will be a time when we need engineers. And I can use the website to get in this database? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Wait, there's a lot more. <laughs> Um, is this working? Oh. Yes. Uh, my question is very direct. Um, do you think that the resource-based economy can be sustainable if the problems of overpopulation continues? Uh -huh. uh, problems of overpopulation will produce serious problems in the world. If, uh, if the Earth can support three billion people, if you go ahead to six billion people, there's going to be malnutrition, diseases, problems, invasion of one territory that has water. So you must maintain the population, not in accordance with what Fresco wants, but the carrying capacity of the Earth's resources. Anybody that doesn't understand that? If you have so much resources, you can only support so many people, unless you invent a new resource. So we must maintain a population that the earth can support. And we'd if have we... to do that essentially through education. But I think when the resource-based economy comes about, depending on how much work you people do to make it come about, because we can't make it happen alone, then there'll be so many options that I think people will be less interested in just having kids. Today, women are given a role to have a husband and have children and not even taught how to raise them. It's the strangest thing, you know. We, it, we go to school for years to work on a jet engine. They don't let anybody touch a jet engine. They have to go to school for years. Yet children have much more connections and parts than a jet engine, and we don't get any training in that. So um, in, in the future, we think that when people have so many more options, they probably will not want children as much as they want today. Well, you're brought up to want children. Like that, they, they Fresco would like free little kids to carry his name into the future. I don't have any such illusions. Kids are a pain in the ass. They say, <laughs> listen to me. They say the same thing. They can't say anything new. Six years old, I want a balloon. They can't say anything interesting. If you really love children, you spend your time with children before you have them. So when people have children, you have to wipe their behind, change their diapers send them to school, and when they're 18 years old, they leave you anyway. So what, what the children, some guy comes up to me and says, I have six kids. I say, what are they for? <laughs> Just having six kids, try to make your kids smarter than you, better than you in every way. When they say, Dad, you're obsolete, you did a good job. Okay? In other words, just having children means nothing. I, I want to thank you for coming. When you leave here, if you do nothing, if you don't talk to people, nothing will happen. Thank you for coming.